Let me give you a little background on the topic. Um, this year's proposition is that design matters more than math. It's a pretty strong argument to be made for the math team over here on my right. Math is proof. Given enough data, and today there's an abundance of data, we can know. And Stuart Brand once said, the right information in the right place just changes your life. Properly harness the power of data analysis and modeling can fix cities, predict epidemics, revitalize education. Abused, it can invade our lives, undermine economies, and steal elections. Surely the algorithms of big data matter, and that's what this team would like you to believe. But your life won't change by itself. Bruce Mao defines design as the human capacity to plan and produce desired outcomes. Math informs, but design compels. Without design, math can't do its thing. Poorly designed experiments collect the wrong data. And if the data isn't understood and acted upon, it may as well not ever been, have been crunched in the first place. So this is the question we're putting towards our debating team. The proposition today is that, and I want to get this very, very clear, design matters more than math. So at this point, I need to do an incredibly <coughs> scientific poll of the room. How many people here, raise your hands and keep them way up, believe design matters more than math? All right. All right, hang on. Keep them up, keep them up. This is going to be tiring. You can't, count them. You can't vote. Hey, design matters more than math. You're counting? We should do like how much I noise. I count about 45. Those of you coming in, raise your hands if you think design matters more than math and get here on time next time. Um, raise your hands if you think design matters more than math. All right, wow, you guys just got a whole horde of ringers in here. Okay, <laughs> now, I got about 45. Raise your hands if you think math, if you disagree, if you think math matters more than design. <laughs> wow, there's a lot more of them over here. They really did move where they wanted to sit, didn't they? <laughs> You know, this is good. The two hands, look, two hands, I can count too, you know. Math is, I'm on the math side too. Um, all right, that's about, buddy, it's buddy. I got about 40. All right, see ya. Yeah, anybody <laughs> want to second that? I think it's about 45 to 40. I think, okay, so I'm going to vote. Uh, like I said, this is the most, at a, at a conference where we deal with data collection, it should be obvious what the real problem with data is right now. <laughs> collection means matters, matters more than math or design. All right. So, opening up on our left, we have two teams. I'll introduce the teams over here. Uh, Monica Rigatti. Dr. Rigatti is a senior research scientist at LinkedIn with a background at Carnegie Mellon, IBM, and AT&T. And Dr. Alexander Gray, who's been working on big data problems since his time with NASA in 1993. Pretty good people for that argument. Over on my left, uh, Julie Steele is the editor of Beautiful Visualization and co-author of Designing Data Visualizations. She's the curator of the Data Visualization Showcase. Uh, the design track that she hosts here. She's also the chair of Strata RX. And clear story it is, Dr. Uh, sorry, Douglas Vandermolen, who formerly led user experience for Google Analytics and a variety of other Google products, both ably equipped to talk about design. So would the first person on the design team like to tell us in four minutes or less why design matters more than math? Sure, so I'm going to start. All right, um, so design matters more than math. Uh, I think if we look around the conference, it's, it's pretty obvious we're investing very heavily in math or technology. And that's great. And I sort of liked it. If, if you went to my talk uh, yesterday, when I came out of Google and I looked around in the big data market, uh, it sort of felt like an old cell phone. So I, if I could use images, imagine those big cell phones, uh, you know, those big brick cell phones. It has very promising technology that we know could someday change the world. But I think it was pretty obvious when people were using that device, they knew there was something more to this, like something else had to change. It really wasn't fitting in the, in the lives of people using it. The same way I think that's where big data is. Now, appropriately so, a lot of people in this room, in this conference, and in Silicon Valley in general, are solving very hard technical problems. But I think if you look at the cell phone, or another example I use, the home thermostat, so some of us at home might have these very, you know, those, those digital thermostats where there's all sorts of inputs in there. We have these things in our lives where we can tell technology leads sort of how that thing is produced. And it's not until I think design really takes hold of a product into a market where there could be mass adoption of that product. And I think we all realize that the technology we're inventing now 
has the potential to change the world radically. So if we look back at the cell phone, or even better, that little um, home thermostat device, the sad thing isn't necessarily that the interface sucks. It's really that there's technology in that device that could not only save home homeowners lots of money, but imagine if everybody in the country across the world were effectively able to use that device that actually was usable, that they used more than 3% of that functionality. It could literally change how, uh, how much energy is needed to, um, to heat homes, which had, could have a radical impact on energy consumption. So in the same way, if we want our big data technology to exist beyond this room, beyond this conference, beyond Silicon Valley, I think you really have to have a firm understanding um, of all the necessary inputs to, to make these things work in people's lives. And that's where design comes in. Um, one other thing, too, is we have to imagine design is more than just sort of what happens on the surface. I think sometimes we think design is just about how pretty a graph is or what color or you know, what color uh, a visualization uses or if an interface has rounded buttons. Uh, design is a lot more than just that. Um, in fact, if you imagine sort of designing a home, so if you built a home recently, it's like saying, you know, application design, uh, if you think application design is just about color and how a graph looks, it's like saying designing a home is just about picking out the color of a carpet or what color your walls you, you want or what hardware you're using in your kitchen. But really, if you're going to design a home well, you have to understand the needs of the family that's going to live there. You know, do you have kids? Are you going to have more kids than you have now? How do you want the rooms configured? Where is the light coming in? And that's where design can help big data shine, which is understanding who's using the product, where they're using it, where there's uh, silos within an organization that could um, use data. Um, and so if you really want to unlock the power of big data, you have to utilize design. All right. Nicely done with uh, a minute to spare, so well, well played. Uh, who of you is going to start? All right. Alex. Well, uh, can you hear me? OK. Uh, I am, in fact, a big believer in design, but we won't mention that for now. As I do like math. <laughs> as a, <laughs> right. We're out of here. <laughs> I am also a rabid and loyal member of Team Math as a uh, professor of machine learning and efficient algorithm. So why math? Well, math, okay. math can do magic um, that you basically can't do in a purely human way. One of the uh, things I'm kind of proud of, in 2000, we were looking at a problem in astrophysics. We needed to compute a certain statistic. Turns out to be critical in astrophysics. We made it. 10 to the 9 times faster with a faster algorithm. There's no way you can do that with anything human unless you get 10 to the 9 humans and you make them each do a piece of the computation or something. Um, Google is magic. Google happens instantaneously and you can search for anything. That's page rank, that's inverted indices. These are uh, part of the math of efficient algorithms. And uh, new kinds of ways of representing data that are explained by math and eigenvalues and so on. Um, there are questions you that cannot even be posed without math. You can't even ask the question properly except in a mathematical way. So if you're trying to diagnose cancer with machine learning, for example, from uh, numbers obtained from people's uh, blood samples, well, you're trying to predict something. How do you even talk about how accurately you can predict something. You need the calculus of probability. Uh, you need to understand the concept of risk. You need uh, also confidence. How can we be confident? You don't want to tell someone they have cancer when they don't and vice versa. You need a notion of confidence. That is a very delicate thing that took decades to even pose that que question properly. And finally, um, the eye, in, in, in the context of data, the eye, you know, design helps humans do things better, but there are certain things that humans just can't do very reliably. We, the eye can only see certain things and is easily mis misled. So you cannot see into more than two or three dimensions, at least I can't. If it's 12 dimensions or 10,000 dimensions, you need to turn to math to even ask certain questions. Um, and finally, even when you can, you think you can see uh, your data in two or three dimensions, there are patterns that you're going to see that aren't actually there because your eye is too well trained to see patterns and, and it will be misled quite often. All right, with uh, the minutes of spare, well done. Julie. 
How, would, how do you feel about this design math debate? Um, I would point out that nobody is saying that math doesn't matter. We're simply saying that design matters more. Um, and <laughs> so you said that math can do magic that you can't do in a human way, and I would agree with that. But what design does is take that from something inhuman back to something human, and that's critical because it's humans that have to make decisions and have to take action based on the information. Because at the end of the day, that's what data is. It's information, and, and what use is it if you can't then change your behavior um, or adjust based on that information? And who's doing that? It's humans most of the time. Sometimes it is machines, typically guided by humans or built by humans. At the end of the day, information is a human thing. So math can do magic that humans can't do, but at the end of the day, design is the language that translates that back into something actionable by people. Um, and that's why it matters more. Uh, you also mentioned that certain things humans don't do reliably. The eye can't see certain things and is easily misled. Well, yes, exactly, precisely. That's why we have to design to take that into consideration. We also can't jump 20 feet in the air. That's why we build stairs. Design is the mental <laughs> stairs that lets us get where we need to go. You have, pl you have plenty more time. More time. You want me to keep going? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, questions that, that can't be posed without math, I'll give that to you. We need certain mathematical concepts. Again, math matters. Um, but if you've read the New York Times lately or any other kind of journalism that they talk about, you know, 30% of risk for this and then one in eight for that. Um, so doing those comparisons and juxtapositions, that's not just math because 30% of one and one eighth of the other is math, but it doesn't make any sense because you can't actually compare those apples to oranges in your mind. So choosing how to frame something, that's a design issue. Design matters more. Not that math doesn't matter, just that design matters more. Um, so I would make an analogy here and say that um, if, if visualization is the sort of truck or the transportation that you're using, ideas are the payload, right? Information is the thing. And algorithms and math are useful for transforming ideas, but they don't communicate or move them from one brain to the other, right? Ultimately, you're trying to get information from one place to another place. And design is that, that mode of transportation that, that makes things human. Um, and, and that's why it matters. I'll, I'll stop there. I'll yield the balance of my time. Well yielded. All right, Monica. Well, it's great to be here defending Matt's honor. Um, <laughs> after all, I'm a data scientist, and my background is in applied machine learning, and uh, even my license plate is this very obscure math pun. Um, so um, so um, it made sense that I was going to be on the side of math on this one. And after having that discussion with Alistair, um, I've been thinking about it, and I noticed something. I noticed that I was spending a lot of time at work talking to data scientists and telling them to visualize their data, to um, clean up their charts and graphs, to make them simple and easier to explain and to digest, and, um, and to make sure that the data products that they're working on, like recommender systems, to make sure they're well designed so they speak to the user. So that gave me pause, right? And it made me wonder, well, wait a second, does design matter more than math? So um, I thought about it, and then it dawned on me. I keep pushing design because the substance is already there. Um, scientists and engineers spent a lot of time, months or maybe years, putting together those data products or building those um, uh, visualizations, the background of that visualization, the back end of that visualization. So um, by the time we got around to it, the substance was already there. So um, that substance is math, right? It's the algorithm that powered those recommendation systems. Um, it's uh, what makes science fiction reality. Uh, it's those uh, Arduino robots. It's space travel, right? It's why we live in the future. Um, and that's why we're all here today, Astrada. And as Alistair mentioned, that's how we're going to decide who wins by counting, right? So um, <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, it's, it's the language we use to, <laughs> to understand the universe around us, right? It's, it's how we communicate across 
time across languages, across cultures. And it's math is substance, and substance is what matters more. All right. Um, some good opening arguments. So uh, it's time for a rebuttal, starting with you, sir. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll start where uh, Monica left off, where math is substance. And I agree it's substance. But I would say, though, sort of back to my original point, if we want that substance to live in this world in a meaningful way, beyond you know, the brilliance of, of the folks over on this side of the room, uh, really normal people, or people who don't get that, they don't really want to see that substance. They want to see that substance embedded in something that works in their lives. So if we want people who don't understand big data or don't un understand you know, the advanced algorithms we're all inventing every day, which are very important, and we want them to actually utilize that, that's when we have to surround those things with, with good design. Right? And it's not just the interface. It's understanding where those fit in the lives of those people, where we can put those algorithms to make them more successful in their job, whether that's predicting how customers are going to buy their product, or whether it's predicting when the next outbreak of a flu is going to be, or, or something like that. You have to really embed that in a meaningful designed application for people to use that. The other point I want to say, too, is um, you know, the whole predictive analysis Thing. So I did a lot of work actually in Google Analytics around this, and I would say, you know, if you just took a pure predictive analysis and it has all these confident, confident intervals, uh, that was one of the hardest things I designed, is how do you effectively communicate to, to the people? Because I think in the same way bad design could manipulate people, I think math could do that as well. So I had, to I had to work really hard to figure out a design which I could effectively communicate to people that the data you're seeing, there is some interval of confidence in here, and you have to communicate that really well to folks. So design really is important on top of math to make the math, the substance we're making, meaningful and relevant to people's lives. That's it? All right. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to make sure. Um, you still had 18 seconds left. I was like, I right. I'm amazed. Usually I do this. And that's like, why design is better than math. <laughs> Usually people are like crushing each other and using up their time. So. All right. Uh, who's going to rebut this one? You want to take that next? All sure. Right. Um, so, sure, design is important on top of math. But the question is, which is more important? So, Google search. Would you rather have Google with a great interface, beautiful interface, simple? but there are uh, six humans behind it and three chimpanzees? <laughs> or would you like a powerful page rank, thousands of computers, math, machine learning, predicting uh, based on your keywords what should be shown to you and so on? And the interface is kind of crappy. <laughs> 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 That's also a good rebuttal. All right. That was it? You're done? You yield the floor? I read my <laughs> all right, Julie. Yeah, let me add it. Um, <laughs> all right, so let's start with math is universal. Uh, it's how we communicate across time and cultures. Um, I call, what's a word that I can use on, on tape? Um, I, I, I call bunk on that. Um, it's not universal. There are cultures that have words for one and two and then more than that. Uh, there, are, there are ways of counting in different cultures that, that are certainly not universal. Um, design, however, cognitive visual perception contains principles that are universal. We know that the Gestalt principles of grouping um, and ranking, size ranking, things like that, those are universal across cultures and, and tribes and time. Um, so I would say if you're going to try to argue on what's more primitive, design wins every day. Um, I would also say, <laughs> Alex, to your point, <laughs> All right, all right. Um, <laughs> Alex, to your point about Google search, um, Google with a great interface or a strong search engine with a crappy interface, I don't know if you've seen those Bing television commercials lately where they, they do a blind test and you know, people say, which set of search results do you like better? And most of them choose Bing because it's a Bing commercial. But why are more people still using Google? <laughs> because the interface makes it worthwhile. That design matters. And people are willing to sacrifice a certain amount of math or, or accuracy when the interface makes them more comfortable and is more usable. And I know I have 30 seconds left, but I'll end there. Wow. Well, can I, can I use those 30 seconds? You may use those 30 seconds. So being a former employee of Google, I also know that they put a huge investment in what seems to be a simple interface. Uh, into the design of that. So simplicity isn't no design. In fact, 
you could characterize some of the best designers in the world really embrace simplicity. In fact, Dieter Rams, who's probably the mo one of the most iconic designers in the 1950s, his influence is seen today through Apple and the iPod, he said you're not done with your design until all the elements that are unnecessary are taken out of that. So simplicity is definitely something that designs. And that's why design is more important. My well-designed phone tells me it's time for another rebuttal. Monica. Um, yeah, I'm a big believer in design and especially data visualization. And I'm glad that we're um, seeing the attention it deserves and that this conversation is even possible, which wouldn't have made sense 10 years ago. Um, so um, there's a premise, though, that I don't agree with, which is that um, design has a monopoly over beautiful, effective communication. Um, because if you think about it, that's exactly what math is, beautiful, effective communication. Um, and we have elegance, we have simplicity, we have creativity in math, right? Those are concepts you associate with math. And uh, I have a quote from Einstein. Um, he said that math is the poetry of logical ideas, right? So, um, and to bring up the story about Nest, um, I actually wanted to get the Nest thermostat. You know, it's very well designed. I, I love it. Um, I wanted to get it. I looked at the reviews and it said that, well, you know, uh, the algorithms aren't very good. So uh, I thought about it, and I said, well, you know what? I love beautiful design, but I'm not going to freeze over it, right? It's not worth freezing over it. So, um, but you know, they're going to get it right. They know what matters more, right? They know, they have smart people. Uh, it's called the learning thermostat. They know that's important. So they're going to get it right, and then I'm going to buy it. So that goes to, you know, wide adoption of a product. Yes, you need the math to work. So. Um, Math is not about A-B testing 50 shades of blue, right? It's, uh, <laughs> it's about making sure that the website actually works uh, and that you don't, don't just ship the designs, right? I mean, there's a reason we don't ship mocks, right? Um, it's about substance. It's about content. So, I, great opening remarks, great rebuttals. Some designer somewhere is going to go write a book called Fifty Shades of Blue right now. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we have a few questions. Some of you have sent me some. I have a couple here. Um, first of all, so I'm going to call out Frank Hangler, who says, this debate needs better definitions. That's the point of debates. But he says, um, we should have called this algorithms versus prettiness. I think I know which side he's going to vote for. Um, so given that's the case, uh, how would your arguments change, design team, if the title of this was Algorithms versus prettiness. So I think that unfairly pigeonholes design. Uh, it's sort of, so I don't think that's accurate to do. Um. <laughs> Here's the thing. <laughs> I edited a book called Beautiful Visualization, and one of the things that I put a lot of thought into when this book was coming together was, what do we mean by beautiful? And I'm going to go ahead and take the liberty of, of substituting beautiful for prettiness, which I'm not sure is even a word. Um, <laughs> beautiful, as we defined it for the purposes of that book, is an elegant solution to some kind of problem, right? That's, that's beauty, is, is sort of an elegant and simple solution, and that's what design really is. So I think... Uh, the attempt to brand design as simply prettiness was, um, was a pretty transparent attempt to, to reduce it to aesthetics. Um, and I think that's unfair and um, incomplete. Inaccurate. Inaccurate. OK. Um, how about you guys? If it was algorithms versus prettiness, how would you fight? Other <laughs> the same than way. better. The <laughs> same way. Do you think it's an unfair characterization to say that design is just prettiness? Yeah, I mean, as a big believer in data visualization, I definitely agree that it's, it's important to have uh, that around. But still, matter, math matters more. <laughs> because it's substance. All right. So um, let me ask you this question. Um, how does design influence the formulation of mathematical algorithms? Taking the other side here, we always look for reducing something to an elegant equation, for example. Is that just design at work in math? And if so, mm. does that mean that design is an inherent part of the mathematical principle? Yeah, take that, Alex. Hmm. Um, absolutely true. Um, elegance is uh, is we all know as uh, programmers um, actually has functional value. Um, it leads to fewer bugs. It leads to greater understanding of code. 
in the end, greater longevity of code. So um, it is true that programmers and mathematicians are the, the best ones, the great ones, are designers in the language of uh, or whatever computer language or the language of math. So yes, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> We, um, we like to simplify the formulas because we want a better model, a better mathematical model that explains the world around us. And that's, that's why um, we like to simplify it to a small, beautiful formula, because it's more powerful. But, but I have to say the difference is that, um, oh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, we can say that? No, no. Okay. The, the difference is that it, it is grounded in something quantitative in the end. And that allows you to know whether you're doing better or not. Um, your intuition, if you're really smart, is great. <laughs> but even when you're really smart, may not be uh, may not be right. So um, we we are aided in our kind of design by being able to quantify whether something is better. All right, design guys. Um, what about the idea that elegance in math is a form of design, and you are looking for elegance, which is a an aesthetic concept? I would say, yeah, we're reaching some common ground now. Um, because I, I would agree that it's certainly possible to reach elegance in math, um, and that, that that is ideal. I love the, the idea that the best mathematicians are designers. I would agree with that. Um, and honestly, the best designers are mathematicians. We have certain principles, like the golden ratio, where you, you know the best design does employ math. So I'm all for a marriage of these two. but. Um, if we're being forced to choose between one or the other, or, or to rank one above the other, uh, I still have to go with design every time. Um, I would, uh, Monica brought up an interesting point about models and trying to get to a simple, elegant model. Um, and I would say, we've got this interesting problem right now, uh, especially in enterprise. Uh, we have a lot of models that are more accurate or uh, result in better predictive results, but we don't always know why they work. They're not transparent. We call them black box models. And a lot of times, companies will choose the less predictive but more transparent model, often out of litigation fears, because they need to be able to stand up in court and defend why they've done something in a certain way. Um, so when it comes to, you know, we sometimes have math that is better in the sense that it's more accurate, but we can't explain it, we don't understand it. Um, and so we actually choose the l less effective math because we, we can see it and design around it. Um, and that, to me, says a lot. Okay. Anything else? Uh, not in 30 seconds, but. All right. Um, so questions to the floor. I have a couple others, but I'm happy to entertain some. Anybody want to raise their hand and ask something nasty? All right, go ahead, you. So Ringer. Perhaps the, uh, the argument would be, and I'll try to even have it, is, uh, is this really about measurability? Because it seems the argument on the math side is to say, look, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it, as Helen would say. The argument on the design side, my question is, are you claiming that design can or can't be measured? If it can't be measured, that's a very strong statement. If it can be measured, isn't it just a subset of math? So did everybody hear that? So basically, is it really about measurability? And if so, then isn't design just a quantifiable mathematical process? And if not, then that says something equally interesting. Is that fair? Yes. I'm going to let the math guys go first. So you uh, get a PhD in HCI, human computer interaction. You, part of what you learn is you got to do a user study. You got to quantify whether your idea about whether it's better or not uh, is true, right? It's a good idea. So actually, it turns out design is a subset of math. <laughs> Elegant, one might say. So, so some, yeah, I agree. It's, it, it, it is about measurability. And sometimes you, you can measure design. I mean, um, you can look at uh, what. Um, happens when you have design without math, right? Um, you get um, iOS maps, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, nuclear. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, you have uh, these beautiful 3D views, except the Statue of Liberty is flat, and the Brooklyn Bridge looks like this, right? Um, 
and um, it's, it's beautiful and it scales and zooms with ease. I think that's what they have on their marketing blurb. Um, except it doesn't quite work, right? Not, not yet, right? Um, I mean, it will eventually once they get the math right. So, uh, so yeah, so I, I agree. Uh, you, you can measure it. All right, that was, uh, go ahead, try it. <laughs> we want to see this one. <laughs> so, <coughs> anybody use Hadoop? All right? Hadoop won't work until you get the design right. And I think there's companies emerging all the time that are trying to address that problem. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of technologies I think we're, we're developing here that in the same way that, you know, a, a pretty map needs design, or a pretty map needs math to work or the right technology, the right technology needs design to work just as much as the other way around. Um, the other thing too, uh, well, Okay, so we, we were talking about um, algorithms versus prettiness a few minutes ago, and I staunchly defended design as being more than just aesthetics. Um, and I stand by that. Design is more than just aesthetics, but it encompasses aesthetics. And please, try to quantify for me the Mona Lisa and tell me how you do. Like, try to quantify some of these things that are just so moving, that are so visceral. Um, design encompasses those things, and you can't quantify them. So no, design is not a subset of math. All right. So uh, I'm going to ask one quick question, and then I'll get to yours, sir. Uh, but I, I feel I want to even things out after the plant in the audience over there. Um, so let's talk about local maxima. So you guys understand the concept of a local maxima, that I can take something and I can optimize it until it's local maxima. But it generally takes a leap of intuition or a, or a change to move from a local to a global maxima. Uh, put another way, humans are really good at inspiration, and machines are really good at optimization. And I would ask you, is it more important to optimize to a local maxima or to have an inspiration that takes you to a new global maxima where more things are possible? You guys first. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> so does everybody here know what a local maxima is? Imagine you're on a hill and the water runs down the hill to a lake on the side of the hill. That's the lowest place the water could run to. But it could also run much lower down the hill to the ocean. So the, the lakeside, the hillside lake is a local maximum. It's a place on the side of the hill. It's the lowest place in that area. Computer algorithms tend to be really, really good at solving for a local maxima. So we have a web page design. I can do a whole bunch of multivariate analysis and testing and optimize clicks. And the algorithm's awesome at that. But if I want to go from 8% conversion to 20% conversion, maybe I have to change my business model. And that's the thing that the local optimization won't do. So generally, from an analytics point of view, uh, web analytics wonks look at optimization as a, as a machine problem, but innovation as a human problem. Yeah, so I would totally agree with that. And I would point you to several uh, historical moments in science. Um, because ultimately, design, I was saying that design is the, the human element. And ultimately, as humans, what we do is tell stories. And there are a few really interesting points in the history of science where the math couldn't evolve until we change the story. So one of those was um, the, the solar system, right? Whether the, the Earth revolves around the sun or vice versa. For a long time, we thought everything, we were the center of the universe, naturally. The sun revolved around us. And they were trying to figure out orbits. You know, Ptolemy was working on this for a while. And you know, of course, they were also assuming perfectly circular orbits. And it wasn't until we changed the story and said, wait, 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 no, actually, we're not the center of the universe. Maybe the, we revolve around the sun, that they were able to start doing different kinds of computations on um, planetary orbits. And it still took them a while to get away from, from perfectly round orbits into the elliptical ones that we now know are closer to the truth. But it wasn't until we shifted that story in our minds that, that the math evolved. Um, another point I would point you to is uh, germ theory, right? Until we, we change the story from, well, we've got these humors and we've got to apply leeches, and to the idea that there was something so small that we couldn't see it that was transmitting disease. Um, only then could science and the math behind it really get to where it needed to be. So the storytelling um, and the design that allows us to think about that are, are the critical factor that let math go forward. The other thing, too, uh, Monica, I think, uh, referenced uh, Fifty Shades of Blue, which I think she's pulling from the blog post that Doug Bowman wrote when he left Google. I don't know if that was it or not. Right, so Doug Bowman, if you don't know, he's the first visual designer hired by Google. And he left sort of publicly frustrated and wrote a blog post about how, as a designer, he was frustrated because Google basically took this approach where they, they were designing through optimization, especially on search. And 
so Doug left, write this blog post, and it did have a culture change within Google. And over time, Google recognized that there is so much you can do with optimization. That's valuable to do. But you also need to bring in this sort of human element where you do take a leap of, from intuition. And it wasn't until then and some other things happening within the competitive landscape that Google really understood that it needs a balance of both sort of this optimization, perhaps the, a math way of, of designing things, uh, versus sort of the human more intuition level. And I, I think Google actually shows an increase in, in design when it did that. All right, two minutes. Local maxima. Um, so the quantum leaps are not necessarily um, the mono design doesn't have monopoly over quantum leaps. You can think of um, theorems or um, mathematical formulations that people realized were true before the physical world caught up with them, and we realized that yeah, that's actually true. He predicted this a hundred years ago, right? I mean, look at things like string theory or a lot of deeper physical uh, things like germs in, in that same vein. So design doesn't have this monopoly over quantum leaps. Uh, math also can offer the quantum leaps. And as far as getting stuck in the local uh, minimum or maximum, um, algorithms offer a solution to that. Math has a solution to that, right? There's a bunch of things you can do to avoid getting stuck in, in the local maximum. You can, you can random sample around. You can, uh, there's, there's simulated annealing. There's a lot of ways you can uh, use to kind of get out of that local minimum and get on moving to discover the, the best possible solution. Uh, but as I mentioned, it's not about A-B testing, it's about the content behind it. It's about making sure whatever you're testing actually works. Local maxima are only a problem if your function is uh, not convex, strongly convex. You just change to a convex function. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> All right, um, I'm gonna take one more question from the floor. I got one more question here. Uh, someone over there had their hand up first, so I'll give it to you first, sir, go ahead. I'm not sure if there's a question in there, but I'll give you guys 30 seconds each to, to talk about whether the universe was designed or, or coded. I don't know. Yeah. That's a, yeah. So, um, okay, I'll let you talk for 30 seconds about if mathematics is the language of design. How's that? You guys first. Well, um, Julia, uh, Julie already mentioned uh, the golden ratio, so my answer is yes, mathematics is the language of design. If we're asking whether mathematics is the language of design, I mean, a few minutes ago we were asking if design was a subset of math, now we're asking if math is a subset of design. So I'll, I'll say yes, sure. <laughs> All right, that, that one was really easy. So, so I'm going to ask one more question. You have a very good point, but I'm just not sure how to get them to hate each other over it. Um, so uh, I have a couple more questions. One is, you guys, design hasn't really talked about, if you run an experiment and you collect crap data because your design was really bad, then your math is meaningless. Discuss. And I'll let you guys go first. I'm just quoting from Twitter here. So. Say that quote one more time. <laughs> if you collect really bad data because you've di designed your experiment wrongly, then the math is useless. <coughs> Experimental design matters as much as you guys are emphasizing the display of something with design. So right. what about the design of the data and the experiment? Sure. So you open with a quote that um, about information. Sorry, where is it? Um, ba -ba -ba that um, it's about getting the right piece of information to the right place, and I would add, at the right time. Um, so yeah, it's nice to have information, it's nice to have data, it's nice to be able to crunch it and apply algorithms to it, but if it's corrected poorly, uh, co sorry, collected poorly, stored poorly, inaccessible at the time that you need it, um, it's useless. All right, design versus data. Okay. So, if you're, you designed your experiment poorly, it's because you didn't read a math book <laughs> called <laughs> Design of Experiments. 
<laughs> that is an area of math, design of experiments. All right, I got one more question. Go ahead, sir. Then we'll get to rebuttals and nastiness. So I'm not a mathematician or a designer, but if I want to cross a river and I don't swim, and the mathematician tells me that on average the river is three feet deep, should I rely on that? Can I rely on that? <laughs> don't no, shoot the messenger. Don't rely on mathematicians. Right. <laughs> Therefore, design is better than that. The designer would build you a bridge, you know. Math math designers would, 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 would design you a nice life jacket and yeah. they'd throw it to you and have a nice logo on it. And You're you'd going be to have safe. votes one at a time, aren't you? Math <laughs> team. I agree. You can't trust averages, which is why math came up with variance, with means. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have, uh, it's time for the speed round. Uh, rebuttals to each, and we start with design so that math gets the last word because we began with design. Uh, which of you would like to go first? Uh, <laughs> Weren't we rebuttaling the whole time? Yeah, yeah. I think this was all rebuttal. closing arguments. So I'll, here, I'll go. So I'll just take the one example of Nest. Um, so I know Nest pretty well. Google Ventures uh, and some of my former friends and colleagues are on the Google Venture team, and they worked really closely with Nest. And Nest spent a lot of time. Uh, unlike what you might think, uh, talking to users, right? They talked to people. They, they really figured out how people wanted to use Nest within their home. And I think Nest sort of got the fact that design is better than math because they knew if they can convince people that this device was something that, you know, they really wanted, they convinced through, you know, the ease of use of design and it worked good enough that they always knew they could add more math on top later. And so I think that's a good example of, at least from a market point of view, they understood that you know, people are looking for things that they want, that they crave. And Nest provided that device for, for these folks. All right. From the math side, closing arguments. Two minutes. Yeah, go ahead. So um, I'm sorry to have to deliver the final crushing blow, but <laughs> big data is small data without efficient algorithms. In fact, data can't even be talked about properly without probability and statistics. In fact, there are no computers without math and the mathematics of uh, computation. And programming languages are, in fact, math. So if big data were to have as its only basis design, well, that's the public library and a stack of books that are prettily designed. The alternative is the beautiful richness that we have here today. So, um, All right, wait, wait, wait. Julie, then you. You get the last word. Go ahead, Julie. Oh, I didn't realize I was going to get another last word. Sure, I would just add that um, you know, we're all here in the context of big data. We're all here in the context of putting data to work for our companies and for ourselves. Um, and that requires that it be accessible to a lot of people, people who have to make decisions, people who have to take actions. And the thing that makes data accessible uh, once you apply the math, because again, we're not saying that math doesn't matter, it's critical, but design is more critical because once you have that information, once you apply those algorithms, you have to be able to take action on it in a timely fashion at the right place at the right time. And design is, the, is everything that allows you to do that and do that well. All right. Final remarks. Monica. So I started uh, with a quote from Einstein about design, about math being the poetry of logical ideas. But and I'd like to go to the opposite end of the spectrum and uh, quote a TV show. And you might recognize this. Um, we all use math every day to predict weather, to tell time, to handle money. Math is more than formulas or equations. It's logic. It's rationality. It's using your mind to solve the biggest mysteries we know. So that's their take on it, right? But uh, I'm more pragmatic, so uh, here's how I like to think about it. An iPhone without design is a Blackberry. <laughs> An iPhone without math is two beautiful tin cans with a string. <laughs> I mean, which would you rather have, right? Thanks. All right. So uh, thank you both for a heated debate. Let's do a little voting. So if. After, first of all, if you walked in 
after we started and you didn't get to raise your hand once already, please abstain from voting. You're welcome to laugh at the good parts, but don't vote twice. Or don't vote if you didn't vote before. Now, raise your hands if you believe, after all this debate, that design matters more than math. And leave them up. Design matters more than math. I think it's actually a little up. I'm counting about 50. Okay, raise your hands if you think that math matters more than design. Move on. Uh, that's, that's gone up. Either that or some people abstained the first time. I think I'm going to have to give this marginally, since I'm counting, to the math team. Congratulations, guys. All right. I want to like, recount. I want to recount. Recount. Design a better vote. That's um, right. I'd, we need a better vote. I'd process. like to thank our four participants for coming here with a lot of good humor and some great quotes and going at it. Uh, I, don't th I think that I, as, as, uh, now I can be biased. I think the killer blow was the Apple Maps. Um, I think that was just <laughs> deadly. So very well played, all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going back to the main stage. We have the final keynote, so we'll see you there. It's fun.